Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is John. John, welcome to the show. Hey, Vic. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thanks for being here. You know, I appreciate it. John, please give us a brief bio on yourself. I'm 66 years old. And first and foremost, I'm a Christian. I'm married to a beautiful and lovely wife who is my best friend. I served in the military. I've hunted and fished and camped all my life, and I love the outdoors. I'm a machinist. I work for the CIA. I'm a gunsmith, third-degree black belt. I was a professional bouncer and a bodyguard. That should sum it all up. Wow, John, you haven't exactly lived a boring life, have you? No, uh, my wife says I could definitely write a couple books. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. From what I understand, dogmen aren't the only kind of cryptids you have hanging around your property. Please expand on that for us. We have Bigfoots here. We have two types. We have type 1 and type 2. And uh, recently, we've only had one type of dogman here. But now we have, uh, just in the last three weeks, a second type came. And it's a canine type, and they're bigger than the chow type that's usually been here. Wow, I can only imagine what it must be like to live in a property where you not only have to deal with Sasquatch, but dogmen as well. Well, the, the Sasquatch aren't too much of a problem. We kind of come to terms with each other. I mean, they know that we're here. They know that we know that they're there, and they know that we're here, and they they mess with us a little bit. They When it first started, it was pretty bad, but now we, we kind of settled in, and, uh, you know, we have plenty of deer, plenty of corn. We have soybeans. We have a water supply. I mean, and we have walnuts. I mean, they got a whole bunch of places to eat, hide, and feed, and so um, we pretty much leave each other alone. It's what these other guys... I have a problem with uh, the dogmen, especially these new ones that have come into the onto the property. Uh, these new ones are very aggressive and sinister. The chow ones are interested in us, and they still are. But they uh, they once you spot them or you 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 hit them with a spotlight, they take off. These other ones, which uh, other than you call them um, a canine type, these guys hold the ground. They don't care if you got a spotlight on, and they don't care if you yell at them. And they're scheming. They 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 kind of entrap you. They'll they'll keep you your attention in one location, and one will come around and outflank you, and come in on you. And uh, they've done that. The first day I met them, the first day they were here, that I saw them, they did it the first day. So these guys are a little more sinister, and uh, they pretty much chase the bigfoots off when they're here. Well, needless to say, I feel for you. It's one thing to have Sasquatch hanging around your property, but when the dogmen move in, that's when it gets serious. Yeah, I I don't understand. I mean, it, this has been going on for three years. These dogmen only been here since March of last year. I, I don't know what made them come in, but they, they arrived and they have not left. Unfortunately. Yeah. Before you had that first dogman encounter last March, did anything happen on around your property that might have tipped you off that they might have been around? Well, we heard a howl one night. Sometimes when we know the Bigfoots are on the property, before we go to bed, me and my wife, we go into the master bathroom and we, and we shut all the lights off and we open the window and we listen to hear them scream. Well, it was in March and we hear this howl out in the distance. And I'm going, that's a wolf. And, and my wife goes, that's a wolf. And I said, no, that's a dog, man. Because I heard that exa exact same how on the Internet at two different locations. And this thing, I had a stopwatch with me. My wristwatch is a stopwatch. These howls were, the average was 26 seconds to 28 seconds. 
but the average was 26 seconds long. That's some lung capacity. And since these Bigfoots moved in, nothing in our woods ever screams at night anymore. Coyotes, nothing. And this thing had the guts to stand out there all by itself and scream away. So that was the first way I knew that they were on the property. Well, that's a rough way for it to introduce itself. No, the actual introduction happened the day after. That's when I got introduced personally. That happened with, we burn wood in the wintertime because my wife likes the warm heat. I got home from work at 4.30 and I went out at 5 o'clock to load up our cart. And we keep it in the garage and I draw wood from it. And as I was loading up, a Bigfoot screams at me on the northwest part of my property. No big deal. That's happened before. And But I thought it was unusual him doing it at 5 o'clock. I mean, it was an overcast. It's in March. And uh, so he screams at me. And as soon as he got done screaming, I get roared at. Now, I never heard this before. Now, since it happened to me, I, I, I found out that the dogmen roar. And I've heard a couple of roars on the, on the, on the internet, but this thing roared at me and it was so not 75, they're 75 yards away from me, but they're standing in the woods enough to where they can see me and I can't see them. All right. Cause there's, there's a straight line of shot where I was standing. And what happened was it roared and I can feel it in my chest. And then as soon as it stopped roaring, it barked six times. And it sounded like a 600-pound Rottweiler. And that was my first introduction, letting me know that they were here. But as you'll see, as as I talk about the other encounters that happened, um, the couple of them were, well, the one was really high pucker. Uh, and so I will explain that as we go along. Yeah, it definitely was a high pucker one. Before we continue, for anyone listening who doesn't know, John was our guest on episode 157 of Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio two weeks ago. If you haven't heard that show, I'd highly suggest you check it out. Well, John, you've got a lot of encounters to tell us about tonight, but before you tell us about them, please tell us about your property, since that's where all but one of your encounters happened. Well, I'll lay it out like this. If you think of a popsicle that's an acre big. And instead of the popsicle being round, it's square. And the stem of the popsicle would be a 100 yards long. That'll represent the rifle range. We built our home at the edge of our property, the front of the property. And if you were to lay that popsicle down on the ground and point the stem at the north, setting on a compass, and turn it eight degrees to the right, that's how my house sets on the property. All the popsicle and the stem is every area that I mow. Now, from the stem, 35 degrees to the left and 135 degrees to the right is all woods. And the wood line is 25 yards from my house. And so we're facing the center part of our woods, and we have 6.6 acres going back into our property. And behind that is 289 acres of farmland, and heavily wooded area. Now, my property, when we first came here, we wanted to have a nice wooded area here, and we bought this 20-some years ago, 26 years ago. Uh, It was a cornfield, and we let it grow up, and I cut trails all through my property in a lot of different directions. And so as every year that went by, we mowed and mowed and mowed, and now our trees on our property are 29, 30 feet tall, and they canopied the trails. So the trails are sealed completely dark. It canopied. You cannot, in the summertime, there is no, very little sunlight gets into those, into our property. So you can be standing in the yard in the sun and you see this pitch blackness and our woods is very thick. So they seem to like canopy. It's, in the summer, it's cooler in there. And in the winter, it's, they're still hidden. They're, they're well hidden in there. So they seem to love our wooded area and the canopies and how it's overgrown. You can't see into the woods real easy because there's no sunlight that gets in there. And that's how our property sits. Well, it sounds like a perfect habitat for them. No wonder you've got them hanging around. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I agree with that statement. Um, it seems, I mean, I did it because we want, we'd like to walk the trails in the summer. 
And now we can't do that without being heavily armed, and I wouldn't even do that even heavily armed with, with just me. I do it with a, a group of people maybe, but not just one person. Well, I'm glad you know better than to try doing that because, yeah, that wouldn't be a wise move. All right, John, please tell us about all of your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. All right. Well, first of all, I had an encounter when I was 12 years old. It was a bad encounter. Um, My dad was a manager of a baseball team, and they won the championship. And so my dad wanted to celebrate the 4th of July in this little park called Liberty Park out of Girard, Ohio. And uh, on 7-4-64 at 4 a.m., my dad drags my butt down there, and I'm 12 years old now. And we, we put reserve signs on the pavilion because it's first come, first serve. So he wanted the whole team under the pavilion. So we put reserve signs on the pavilion, and, and, and my job was to stay there and to make sure no one come, came in there and took over the pavilion because he wanted it for the team. Now, the layout of this place... Um, Mosier Road, which is the front entrance of this park, is actually, the park's about a mile, mile and a quarter from my house. And Mosier Road is at the end of my street, and it goes, it's going northeast. And when you get to the top of the hill of Mosier Road, the park entrance is at the bottom of the hill. And this hill's about a, a 120 yards, 125 yards long. And at the bottom of the hill, there's a gate. And you go through that gate. You go in about maybe 75 yards, and the and the road splits into three directions. It goes to the left, up over the hill, to the swimming pool. You go straight to the back of the park, and you hang a right, and it goes to a bridge, and then to a parking lot. And then the parking lot is on the other side of the – there's a mound right there where they parked. At 12 years old, I can just see over the top of that mound. You go up three steps and then down three steps and there's the playground and the pavilions to the left and the park ranger, uh, little huts right to the right of the pavilion. And to the right of that, there's a big cookout area with four different, uh, areas where you can uh, cook, um, hamburgers and hot dogs. They had grills all set up in there permanently with a shed, uh, with a, with a roof on top. Now at the park ranger station, there was a street light. So it it lit up some part of the area back in there. Now, from the gate to the bridge is 400 yards. From the bridge to the parking lot is 200 yards. So that means from the parking lot to the bridge, it's 600 yards total. And so straight as the crow flies. So my dad leaves me down there. I'm sitting on the steps in front of the mound facing the parking lot and just listening to the sounds and and all that's going around me. And I'm there about 10 minutes. I mean, it wasn't long. And I hear something crashing through the woods up behind the park ranger station. Oh, by the way, that rate that we're in a valley there. So up behind the park ranger station, all the woods goes up on a hill. And up on the top of that hill, there's houses. On the main st- on the main street in for Gerard, that's the main street in Gerard, and and those houses in the backyards, it, it's heavily wooded down to the bottom where the park is, where the playground is. So I hear something crashing in there, and it's getting louder and it's coming closer. So I stand up and I'm just peeking over that little mound, standing in the parking lot, and I see a figure. It runs in where the where the where the barbecue places where the, where, the, where the grills were, and in those grill areas, they had uh, stacks of, of wood. Each one had a little stack of uh, pre-cut wood. And this thing knocks the wood down, and it runs and runs behind the park ranger station. So I, I'm, I crouch down, and I'm wondering, uh, is it somebody, a guy? Because I, 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 it was running on two feet, on two legs. And, and and I know it was looked like he was wearing dark clothes. Well, I'm standing there, and it runs from the ranger behind the ranger station into the pavilion. 
And now, before I tell you what happened next, in this pavilion, there's at least 15 or 16 tables. They're 14 feet long, and it takes four to five men to move one. Now, I'm 12 years old now. So we have signs on all these tables, and I hear tables being flipped over, crashed, and then I see a table getting tossed out of the side of the pavilion. Now, the pavilion has open sides on on three sides, and the one side had it on the corner was was um, sealed in. That's where the sinks were and, and kitchen counter table uh, tops and, and people prepared their food. Well, this thing tosses a, a picnic table out of the side of the pavilion, and I decided it's time for me to go. So I crouch down, and I start quietly jogging down. I make it to the bridge. I turn around. Nothing's happening. He's still messing with the tables because I can hear them crashing. And I take off on a dead run and I make it to the gate. And just as I got to the gate, I turn and I see this figure run up on the mound where I was standing, where, right in front where I was standing. It was silhouetted by the park ranger light, uh, street light. So I take off up the hill and I can see this thing running straight at me. So I run up the hill. I make it to the top of the hill, and I turn around and look down, and this thing just comes running out of the gate, front gate. So the time it took me to run 120, 25 yards, this thing ran 600 yards. And I'm going, that's not possible. So I I start crying, and... I start running, and I'm running down Mosier Road right dead smack in the middle of it. And there are streetlights. And as I'm running, I turn, as I pass the streetlight, I turn around, and I see this thing. It's getting closer and closer and closer. And when the, by the time I made it to the bottom of my street, it was one streetlight away. And when I turned up my street, as I turned up, there was a nice, uh, there was a, Street, uh, street light right at the corner. And as it ran under the corner, I got a good look at this thing. And it was covered in hair. It was a, it was a Bigfoot. I wasn't an exceptionally large Bigfoot, probably around six and a half feet, maybe seven feet. Um, it wasn't massive like some of the ones I've seen here, but, um, it was all covered in hair and it chased me right up the center of the street. Park cars on both sides, and I'm running, and I'm screaming. Now, this street's pretty long, and intersecting this street, like a T, is a street called Davis. And Davis Street, from Davis Street, two houses up on the right-hand side is where I lived. So I run up. By the time I get to the street corner, it's right behind me. I run into my front yard, I open the screen door, and I'm beating and I'm screaming. And this thing is standing on the sidewalk, 25 feet from me, looking at me. And I'm looking at it, and I'm beating on the door, yelling for my mom and dad. And this thing stops, looks at me, slowly turns, starts walking across the street. Now, across the street... There was two neighbors that shared the one driveway, and then as the driveway went through, at the back of the driveway, one went to the left and right to their garages. And right past that driveway, there's a wooded area there, heavily wooded field. Well, my mom opens the door, and I said, and I grabbed my thing, I said, look. And she turns over. Now, they had their back porch lights on, so it was illuminated enough. She could see it walk between the two oak trees into the woods. She saw it. That was my first encounter with a Bigfoot. Uh, It shook me up pretty bad. So my dad, you know, he didn't believe. He said it was probably somebody drunk, and he's just trying to scare you. And so we go back down to the the park, and uh, we get there, and he takes me right back down there. And I said, look at that. And he looks over and he sees four picnic tables tossed onto the ground outside the pavilion. I said, do you think I did that? 
And we, he went over there, and all the other ones, almost all of them, not all, not all of them, but almost all of them, and inside the pavilion were, were flipped over. Some were flipped on top of each other. Uh, it was almost like this thing was angry, and it just made a mess of everything. And so my dad tried to pull one table over and flip it, and he couldn't, even with me helping him. We couldn't flip it. So my dad said, well, um, so he couldn't say anything. So he he went into the car and fell asleep, and I stood there sitting on the park steps, scared to death, and watching every sound and thing that went around me. That was my first encounter. My next one started, it was 2015, just a week before Thanksgiving. We were having, we, me and my wife just finished dinner, and uh, we... I helped her clear the table. Actually, we were, we, at, we ate at the bar. So our backs were to the windows, which was our backyard. And, um, we ate at the bar. We helped clear the table. And I just got a brand new 700 loom flashlight. And I just got it charged and I wanted to test it out. She was doing the dishes. And so I went to the back window, which is right on our deck. I opened the window up. I turned the light on and right, like I said, I had trails cut through all my property. And right at that window, Right outside that window, about 20, 25 yards away, there's a clump of saplings and bushes, and there's trails on both sides of this this little clump. And these saplings are maybe, there's a cedar tree in there too, a small cedar tree. They're maybe 9, 10 feet tall. They're not that big. And so I'm shining on that, I'm on that, on that the sapling, and I'm adjusting the beam, and all of a sudden, the saplings start moving. And this... Bigfoot. Now, after the next day when I came out to see the size of this thing, it had to be around 10 foot tall because I, I had the light on it. I didn't even see it. I, if it didn't move, I would have never known it was there. If it had just stayed still, I would have just closed the window and it would have been forgotten. But he got nervous and he runs out of that, that cluster of, uh, of bushes and he turns to over his right shoulder, and I see the two red eyes, and I see his bicep. I don't see two, and his chest area. Now his bicep was as big as my waist. This thing was massive, and he he runs right into the woods, right behind there. And that was my first Bigfoot encounter. He was he was an he was a type one alpha male. He was massive. Uh, he was he was just big. He wasn't cut muscular. I'm sure that was all muscle, but it wasn't cut like like a bodybuilder. It was just just big, massive muscle. And from that day on, they started messing with us. I was telling you earlier that what we used to do is we listen in the back bedroom, and uh, the Bigfoots they they messed with us, throwing rocks and screams and beating on the house. But anyway, that started this whole mess. Now. The first week of March of this year, I was telling you earlier that we heard that howl at the, in the backyard. Now, you need to understand something. The Bigfoot, they had a cycle that they did. They, every 10 to 12 days, they would come around, and they would stay for two to three days, and then they'd leave again, and the cycle would start over again. This has been that way for a couple years. Now, when the dogmen showed up, that changed a little bit. Now, the kind of type of dogmen that we have here are chow types. So the chow head, um, the biggest, oh, well, I can't say that the other one was big, but the biggest one I seen was about a nine footer. But the mostly, the ones I see are se six to seven feet tall. They're, I saw, you'll hear about the one here, the big one here in a little bit. Well, uh, the next day I told you that I got barked at and the Bigfoot screamed at me. But on June 5th, at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, I was working on our deck. Oh, another thing that's going on around here. It, it, there's, there's no birds or insect sounds around our house anymore. I think this past summer we heard insect sounds only two times. We used to hear them every night. And one of the things we loved about our woods there, you know, the tree frogs, the insects chirping, the fireflies flying around, none of that happens anymore. No birds, no insect sounds. It's dead quiet. 
Now, that's been a common thing since these dogmen arrived. And um, I was working on the deck, getting cleaning up the deck, actually getting the deck ready to start bringing out the lawn furniture and all things for the, for the summertime. And on the northeastern part of my property, I hear a little girl cry for help. And it goes, help me, help me. It says it twice. So I stop, and I look over there, and I see nothing in the woods. Actually, I can't see nothing in the woods. The woods is all dark. I'm waiting for her to say something again. If it really was in trouble, and it was a child, it would it would say it more than two times. Nothing happens. So I go back to cleaning the deck. On the east side of the property, about 10 seconds after I started cleaning the, uh, getting the deck ready again, I hear another little girl scream, help me, help me. It was the same, help me, help me, but it was a different voice, but it sounded like a little girl. Now the back of my hair on the back of my neck stood straight up. And I knew it wasn't a Bigfoot because when a Bigfoot talk, it's very deep and, and hoarse. This sounded just like a child, but it was different from the first help me, help me. I looked, and I didn't see anything, and so I just went right back to cleaning, and it didn't. she didn't scream for help anymore. Now, on June 6th, 2018, at 2.45 a.m. is when I saw my first dog. Our bedroom is on the northwest side of the house, and our bed is up against the outside wall. And on my side and my wife's side, there is a window on both sides. Our master bath, as you're facing, if you're facing the outside wall and facing our bed, our master bath is to the right at the back of the house. We have, one thing I didn't tell you, we have motion detector lights all around our property, our home, on every corner. You cannot walk up to our house without turning on a light. And, uh, so that's, and we have, there are 500, uh, 500 watt lamp lights. Um, they're not store bought. I built them from scratch. I buy the, the light unit in the, in the housing separate and then I buy the sensor separate. I use the stealth sensors. They're, they're the best in the business. And, uh, they're, they're good out to 90 feet and you can nail something out there 90 feet out with these stealth sensors. They're very good. They're expensive, but they're good. So, I get up at 3.45 to go to the bathroom. And I stood facing my wife's side of the bed. And just as I looked up, the outside light over the master bath turns on. And I can see perfectly right through the edge of the blind on my wife's window very clearly. I can see that section of the house. I see a dog man who is standing there frozen under the light with a look on his face like, I got busted. Then his expression changed to a sneer. I, it's all I can say. It, it sneered. And this is what I saw. This thing was seven feet tall. It was very skinny. It was so skinny I thought it was starving. I never, it, 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 and it was, I can't, I can't explain how skinny this thing was for the height. I thought, it, looking at it, I thought it would be easy to take it out with a shotgun. That's how skinny it was. And you listen to all these tales of how big these dogmen were, and I thought this, this thing would easily be put out with a shotgun. It was a smoky gray color. It had a chow head. And what I mean by a chow head, the hair, the picture of dandelion. You know how a dandelion puffed up all the way around and put a dog face right in the middle of it? That's how its hair stuck up all the way around the face. Its head was three times larger than it should have been compared to the body size. It looked like a live bobblehead, very disproportionate and cartoonish and unworldly-like, it, like it couldn't be real. It, I mean, you look at the size, the head was massive. Compared to the thin body, uh, it, didn't, it didn't match. It had a mane like a lion, and it was very well-groomed. Now, the hair on the top of the head it started to the forehead, it went back, combed back, perfectly back towards the back, six to eight inches long, and it was thick around the shoulders, the back of the neck, and then it tapered down the back of the the body from the shoulders. It tapered into a V down to the tailbone. 
And as it, as it, the hair went farther down the back, the hair got shorter. It wasn't six to eight inches long in the back. And it was well groomed. Looked like it, it was, it looks like it was shaved. I mean, it was perfect. In the front, the hair went from the shoulders in, the, in a V down to the solar plexus. And it was well groomed and shaved. The hair in the front was a little shorter, but not by much. The rest of the body was human. Human skin. His abs were ripped. It had a six pack. Uh, for a minute there, I, I thought it was a person in a costume. Uh, it, it, I couldn't wrap my head around. I'm looking at a dog and a person at the same time. It had short hair running from the shoulder just above the elbow. It was, and the hair, uh, I couldn't see it very clearly. It was laying flat and it went, and then from the elbow down, it was human. But I, I couldn't see the hands. The body was light skinned and, um, I couldn't see the hands or the feet. I'm sorry that I couldn't, I, uh, uh, but you'll see why here in a minute. The snout was four to five inches long and it was bright red, fire engine red or craftsman toolbox red, but a little brighter. It had a black nose and black eyes. It had a scowl on its face. I mean, it was, it was pissed off. It was really pissed because it, it got busted under that light. And I think the reason why it came to the house, my wife had her window open by six inches to get the air in. It had very sharp teeth. Now, I'm going to try to explain this. Um, they make a wood rasp that's very aggressive. These wood rasps, um, they got quarter inch teeth on them. It, it's a very aggressive wood rasp. And they're kind of like, if you're looking at the wood rasp and you're holding it up, the teeth are like on a 45 degree angle and there's like five or six teeth in a row. About a quarter inch long. Well, this, I got a good look at his mouth, inside his mouth. It had a big wide gum. And its teeth reminded me of that wood rasp, only these were about a half inch long. And they were pearly white, and they were pointed like a needle. And the upper teeth and the lower teeth, when it closed its mouth, they 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 meshed together. They joined together like it was perfectly spaced for each other, like they, they fit like a glove. And uh, there was like three or four rows of them in its mouth. It had two canines sticking up from the bottom and two canines sticking down from the top, protruding an inch and a half to two inches. And they also were very pointy and sharp. This thing reminded me of Greek mythology. I, I, I couldn't, I, when, it, when I saw it move its mouth, I knew it wasn't a person in a, in a, in a costume. Uh, this thing was real. I took two steps to the left to go to my window to get a better look at this thing. And this thing was gone. It traveled 25 yards in the time it took me to walk two steps to the window. And I was moving to get there. And I, I didn't see anything. I didn't see no tail on this thing. It was in the woods. It was gone. But that was my first encounter. On June 9th, the same week, now, mind you, this is four days after my first dog sighting ever. And this is going to be 60 miles east of my house. Me and a friend of mine, I'm going to call him Lee, went to his farm to test loads. We had, we just purchased two brand new sniper rifles. And we, we're going to test loads for these. These are hi highly accurate guns. They are 308 caliber. It's a very loud caliber. And these rifles have muzzle brakes which even, even makes the guns even louder, especially for the shooter. And you need to remember that because it's going to pay later on in the story here. You're going to see why that was so important. And we also had, I also brought an AR-15 out there that, that I had to sight in. And we went out to Lee's farm. We got there around 10 o'clock in the morning. Like I said, it was 60 miles out. Now, the route we took was state route 125 and when we turned off out here in the country roads, the farther out, when you get on a country road out here, it's usually a car and a half in width. And then if you go really deep into the country, it's a car width. Well, we, we 
we came off of 125 and we drove seven miles back into the into the country and we were back on a road started out with a road and a half and we're now on a a one lane road and uh Lee's farm it it was like a gravel road off that road that seven mile stretch I only saw one other farm one farmhouse that's it so it's pretty far out there we turned off on onto his farm on his driveway and uh his homestead is 250 uh, 300 yards from the road now from the road to where the barn is and the house and the little huts are is solid woods thick old oak oak old woods big trees 85 to 95 feet tall. Now, Lee's farm is 4,000 acres. And it's an old growth. It's, these trees back in the back part of the farm, um, while Lee, he cleans out 100 acres a year. He doesn't clean cut them out. He cleans out the biggest trees. And he takes nothing under three feet in diameter. So it's three feet in diameter or bigger. And he, is, he does 100 acres a year. He's owned this farm for 10 years. And, uh, where the house and the barn is, now the barn is a full size barn. And he doesn't have a regular house there. They knocked the house down when he bought the property and he built up these little, uh, cabins, 20 by 20 that they sleep. Uh, they have a bedroom, have a little kitchenette, a toilet and a shower. And, uh, and he has three of them there. And then he has an outside toilet set up that's really nice with showers. And he brings the family out there. They camp and they, they do cookouts and it's a getaway for the family. Now he has 15 acres right there that he mows. And at the edge of the mowed line, there's a hundred acres of straw. And maybe I don't, I don't know how wide it is because it went over the hill. I didn't see how wide it is. I mean, how long the width wise, but the depth wise, it's about, uh, 300 yards. And, uh, at the end of the 300 yards, you go back into, it's going into his wooded area. He cut into the woods to make the rifle range 25 to 30 yards wide, 150 yards deep. And he went in there with a dozer and he pulled all those stumps up. He cleaned them out, he cleared it out completely clean. He pulled those stumps up and root balls and all. And these root balls are eight to 10 feet in diameter. And he took all these uh, stumps and he piled them up at the end of the range. And how the stumps are at the back part of the, the farthest part from the tree, the targets, the stumps are about two stories high and it tapers down into the angle. And there's like 65 to 75 stumps all piled up in there. And he uses the stumps as a backstop for the rifle range. He built a nice rifle range in front of it, a, a nice place to hang up targets. Now these stumps and these root balls, like I said, are eight, the, the root balls are eight to ten feet in diameter. We, uh, went down there and we walked around this stump area he wanted to show me. Now behind the stumps, the land tapers off gently for down about 30 yards and then it comes to a sheer cliff and it drops straight down about 900 feet. At the bottom of that cliff, he calls it a creek. Uh, I call it a small river, but there's a river flowing in there about 35 feet wide. And he, he said it averages three to five feet. Some places there's six or seven feet. And he calls it his creek. And it's running at the bottom of this, this sheer drop off. And um, something dug at the back of these tree stumps. Some, there was two tree stumps butted together face to face, the root balls. Something broke through those root balls, broke the roots, and dug out the clay, and made an entrance four feet high by two feet wide. And it goes into the stump pile. And you can see there's a tunnel in there. And right where the clay fell, at the where he's digging this out, the entrance out, it's all flattened. Like something's been walking on it in and out. This is important because uh, this is going to be part of the encounter. 
So we, you know, I, I mentioned something's living in there, and he agreed something is living in there. Don't know what it is, but uh, we talked about it. We laughed, and we walked back around, and uh, we decided we set up targets, and we commenced firing. Now, because of the logging and the thinning out of the trees, the underbrush in this on on both sides of this range and everywhere he he cleared. Is a, it's very thick. It's six to seven feet tall. And in some places you can only see a foot within into the brush. I mean, it's, you can't walk through it. It's so thick. And that was the case on both sides of this range. Now I need to tell you something about the targets because this is going to play a part in this also. The kind of targets we're using, there are five rows of five targets. And each target is a two and a half inch diameter bullseye. And when you're testing loads, you start at the upper right hand corner, which would be the first target, and you fire in it, and you have a blank target sheet at your place, and you mark the hole where the, the shots hit, and then you mark the load, and then you go to the next load, and you, you test your loads that way. And we've been there all, we've been shooting there all day long. At around six o'clock, a little after six, Lee was writing information down in his log, and I was getting ready to hang another target, and I heard a baby cry. And I stopped, and I, I said, Lee, did you hear that? So he takes his mother, I said, what? And he said, did you hear that? And he said, hear what? I said, did you hear a baby cry? He said, there's no babies. We're in the middle of nowhere. There's no babies out here. I said, I heard a baby cry. He said, no, you did It's your imagination. He puts his ear protection back on, and he keeps on writing in his notebook. Well, less than a minute later, I hear the baby cry again. This time it's closer and louder. And I get puckered. The hair on the back of my neck stands straight up. The hair on my arm stands straight up. And I'm thinking, this is going to be bad. So I ended up, I, I sighted the error 15 in earlier. So I grabbed my Air 15, and I made a big show of this. I took my time, tapped the rounds as I loaded the, the, the three. I loaded three 30-round magazines. I loaded the sniper rifle magazine. We've been loading one shot at a time. It has a 10-round magazine. I loaded 10 rounds of 308 in it, and I loaded two extra Glock 23 clips, and I stuck them on my belt. Now, I went down and I replaced the new target. Now you gotta understand, we're shooting 308s with muzzle brakes. They're very loud. We're a hundred yards away from the targets in the backstop. And we're wearing ear protection. I'm aiming at the first target on the upper right hand row. And as I'm looking through the scope, I can see two thirds of the wood, of the, of the stump pile in my scope. I can see it. So I, I'm looking at the right place at the right time, and all of a sudden, I hear and see a huge tree snap. I hear it, but I see it at the same time because I see the tree snap come up through the middle of the wood pile, I mean, the wood stump pile. I see the chunks fly up in the air about the size of a, of a fist, and they went up about 15, 20 feet. The debris flew straight up in the air. Now, mind you, we're 100 yards away again wearing ear protection and shooting three hundred eight rifles. And you also got to remember, the moment that the tree snap happened, Lee fired his rifle. And the tree snap was three times louder than than the rifle was, and he heard it over the shot. I saw the snap through the scope. He saw nothing. Lee gets off the rifle and goes, what the hell was that? I said, it was a tree snap. He goes, that was pretty loud. I said, yeah, it was. And as soon as I said that, 20 yards till I left, another tree snap, just as loud. And we both see two large black figures running through that underbrush. They're ripping up saplings, two-inch saplings, and throwing them in the air and breaking branches and, and breaking whatever else they found in it because they made one heck of a ruckus. Now, I see for a second the head of one of them, and the head had a snout. And I knew it wasn't a Bigfoot. It was a dog man. But these things were making rackets, and they they ran right down alongside the range on the left-hand side. Lee said, what was that? 
I said, didn't you see it? He goes, I saw it. What do you think it is? I said, I think it's a Bigfoot. I didn't want to tell him it was a dogman because uh, it's hard to wrap your head around a dogman when you see one, let alone somebody that don't know anything about it. So I said, it was a I said, do you have a clip for that rifle? He said, yes. I said, load it. So he loaded his, his sniper rifle clip and he said, you know, I don't feel very com I don't feel comfortable right now. I think I want to go home. I said, that's a good idea because I want to go home too. He said, he, he said, I'm not done shooting yet. I said, well, Lee, there's always another day. He said, I need to get my targets. And he said, and I'm not going down there alone. I said, okay. So I grabbed the Glock and the AR-15, and we walked down to the end of the range, and Lee got his targets. Now, we didn't say nothing. Now, we both drove. But when we got up to the farm, he didn't say anything else. He, he accepted the Bigfoot explanation. But I saw a muzzle on the one. It could have been a Bigfoot and a dogman. I don't know. But the one, I saw the face. It, it had a snout about four or five inches long. And um, they made one heck of a ruckus. And they're living in that in, in that stump pile. So, uh, and I think Lee doesn't go out there by himself anymore. And every time he wants to go out, he was always asking me if I wanted to go shooting. And I think he's so afraid to go on his property. That's four days after I saw my first dog bed. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.